welcome to this special webinar presenting the 2022 Lancet Countdown Report and the Policy Brief from Canada. My name is Ian Colbert and I am the Executive Director of the Canadian Public Health Association and I will be your host today. I want to begin by acknowledging that uh, we, while we are gathered from all parts of Turtle Island, CPHA's offices are located on the, on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe. As noted in the policy brief, we need to honor Indigenous approaches to nature if we are to survive the existential threat posed by global warming. Changes to the ecosystems are part of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people's history and is woven into their DNA. We need to incorporate their knowledge in our approaches to mitigating and adapting to climate change. Since the 1990 release of CPHA's seminal document on human and ecosystem health, CPHA has been concerned has been a concerned and vocal advocate for climate action. We haven't just discussed the issue, but we talked about what changes are needed from community level action to pan Canadian and global initiatives. With funding from the McConnell Foundation, we are documenting the efforts of public health professionals to achieve a different triple aim of promoting public population health, health equity, and climate action through a series of case studies. And I encourage you to check out the first five case studies on our website at cpha.ca. Of course, we've been very pleased to partner with the Lancet Countdown on the, uh, on the Canadian policy briefs since 2017. We were joined by the Canadian Medical Association in 2018 and are very pleased to welcome the Canadian mm -hmm. Nurses Association. Ian, so sorry to interrupt. We just need you to flip down your mouthpiece. Some people are having trouble hearing. See if that's any better. Yes, that would be much better. Thank you very much. My apologies, everyone. Uh, so I will just go back a little bit. Uh, we've been very pleased to partner with the Lancet Countdown on the Canadian Policy Brief since the inaugural report, uh, since, uh, since 2017. And we were joined by the Canadian Medical Association in 2018 and, very, and are very pleased to welcome the Canadian Nurses Association as a sponsoring organization this year. It is now my pleasure to introduce Jeff Blackmer, Vice President, International Health with the Canadian Medical Association. Jeff. Thanks so much, Ian, and thanks to our participants today. The Canadian Medical Association strongly supports the Lancet Policy Brief for Canada because physicians see the impact of climate change in their practices every single day. From increasing rates of respiratory and cardiovascular disease to injuries to even premature deaths related to extreme weather events, physicians and other healthcare providers are on the front lines of this crisis. In addition, physicians experience additional challenges delivering care due to climate-related issues. For example, our current president, Alika Lafontaine, has had to shut down his, op his operating room because it filled with dangerous amounts of wildfire smoke that made it impossible to operate. While they are at greater risk due to climate change, healthcare systems also contribute to it. They are a significant source of greenhouse gas emissions, and they must be part of a global net zero strategy. To mitigate the impact of Canada's health systems on climate change, the CMA recently released a policy on environmentally sustainable health systems that provides recommendations for governments, system administrators, and healthcare professionals for how to achieve climate resilient, low carbon sustainable health systems. Some of the steps physicians and other healthcare providers can take to support climate action include, number one, decreasing the need for health services. Preventative medicine is one of the most upstream mechanisms through which we can decrease the carbon footprint of the health system. Healthier populations reduce the demand for health services. This requires robust primary care systems to be in place in each province to keep people healthier and to decrease our reliance on more carbon intensive health services, such as emergency services. Number two, appropriate prescribing. Up to 30% of tests or treatments in Canada have been found to be unnecessary, and these treatments all carry risks for the patient and produce harmful emissions. Uptake of appropriate prescribing guidelines, such as those developed by Choosing Wisely Canada, would reduce both risk to patients and carbon emissions. And for those asking, I don't have slides, just a brief oral presentation. Number three, in terms of things that we can be doing is advocacy. Physicians can use their expertise to act as powerful advocates for climate solutions. Through advocacy, health professionals can help the healthcare system adapt and increase its resilience to coming challenges associated with climate change. We all together have an opportunity to build a better, healthier, and more inclusive Canada. 
We need to work together to make this vision our reality. The CMA strongly supports the Lancet Policy Brief for Canada, and we have done so since 2018 because it provides concrete, actionable steps to help move us towards this future. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Jeff. It is great to have you and CMA on board with us today. It is now my pleasure to introduce Sylvain Brousseau, uh, President of the Canadian Nurses Association. Sylvain. Yes, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to provide greetings to you today. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. While we meet today, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that I am currently on the, on the unceded territories of the Kanyege Haiga Nations land, the Anishinaabe peoples, and the Old Notionee Confederacy. I am very privileged to live in this beautiful, beautiful and peaceful territory. The Canadian Nurse Association is a national and global professional voice of all Canadian nursing. We are excited to join with such extraordinary partners and this report are an opportunity to join forces with our colleagues in the health profession to hold our governments to account and advocate for system level changes to address climate change. It is important to remember that while health outcomes linked to the environment are a global burden, the heaviest impact is on vulnerable populations such as families living in poverty, women, children, and elderly peoples. First Nations, Miti, and Inuit peoples have a particularly high risk for environmental effects related especially to poor housing, indoor air quality, and lack of clean drinking water. It is no secret that the environment is an important determinant of health. And as we all know, well, there are numerous public health threats related to climate change, such as cardiorespiratory impacts, heart stroke, risk of waterborne disease, food insecurity, among others. We have a deep and shared understanding of how health is affected by the environment and nurses play a key role in supporting adaptation and mitigation with respect to climate change through nursing clinical practice, research, administration, education, and policy. Nurses and all other healthcare professionals can support individuals as well as lobby all levels of government to create structures, policies, and environments that enable and encourage people in Canada to live healthier lives as we are doing with this report today. <clears throat> CNA expects that nurses become more eco-literate and focus on reducing the environmental impact of the health setting and promote environmental health and sustainability. In conclusion, important steps have been taken by governments, but CNA believes we must do much more if we are to avoid the catastrophic effects of climate change. Many policies needed will produce immediate health benefits, reduce healthcare costs, and improve social cohesion and equity in Canada's communities. Thank you again for the opportunity of providing comments from the Canadian Nurse Association, and I wish you a great event. Merci. Thank you very much, Sylvain, and it certainly speaks to the common acceptance of the importance of this work that CMA, CNA, and CPHA have all thrown their weight behind this initiative. Now, the program for the rest of the hour, hour which is packed, uh, will start with a presentation from the findings of the Global Report of the Lancet Countdown, followed by an overview of the policy, for, uh, policy brief for Canada, and then hopefully we'll have some time uh, at the end for questions. So with no further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce Ian Hamilton to present the findings of the Global Lancet Report. Ian. Thank you, Ian and Jeff and Sylvain for your uh, involvement today and for the invitation to come and speak. I'm, I'm afraid I suppose I'm coming with the bearer of bad news, which is uh, on the basis of this year's report, as, as we have been showing of the last several, that the implications around health and, uh, pardon me, climate change and its impacts on health continue to be in the wrong direction. Um, and the indicators continue to mount uh, that show this is not the outcome in the future we, we want or deserve. But I am hopeful, given the Canadian 
uh, brief and the actions that are outlined within it, which you'll hear more about, but these types of efforts can help to address exactly the challenge we are here today. So in the next few slides, um, if we go to the next, I'll be speaking through um, the different indicators and the findings. So this is the seventh report here, are all the, the different reports we've produced over this time. Um, and the highlight for this year really is that we're talking about the fossil fuel industry very directly and the risks that it poses in terms of the continued use and investment that many of uh, many countries and organizations take are, 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 are affecting um, the emissions rate that are in the wrong direction. So this is where we want to be able to, to point out and, and kind of call out the cause and challenges that we have. So on the next slide, I just want to be able to say that this is an enormous collaboration from groups around the world. We're grateful to, to, to their contributions in terms of research time and the communications that everybody spends to be a part of this. And so it's, it's really uh, an enormous effort, which we're grateful for. Um, in the next slide, I uh, wanted to highlight what's new in this year's uh, report. So this is our seventh iteration. It would come alongside several anniversaries of how climate change should be discussed globally. And this is the effort of over, well, there are about 100 authors uh, from 51 different institutions. What's new this year is that as every year we try and improve our indicator set so that we're better able to track some of the effects and the impacts. This year we've highlighted around extreme temperature and food insecurity, a new indicator around household air pollution and increased exposure around wildfires. A new indicator which looks at fossil fuel industry specifically in the incompatibility with the Paris Agreement um, outcome as well as looking at how nationally determined contributions are highlighting health as a part of the argumentation around climate action. And the next slide, um, what, we, what we have here are three different messages that we're bringing forward. So the first, as I mentioned before, around fossil fuel addiction. The reality is that this is exam, uh, exacerbating existing uh, and current crises. So whether that is to do with um, the contribution that's making in terms of direct effects of climate change being experienced today around food insecurity, around extreme heat, the risk of infectious disease outbreaks and extreme weather events. And that this reliance on a fossil fuel based system also leaves households um, who use dirty fuels or vulnerable to energy poverty continuing to be at risk. And these intersecting crises really could be better alleviated through our actions to address climate change by reducing our reliance on the vol volatility of a fossil fuel industry. So in the next slide, the, the next uh, challenge or key message that we bring forward really here is directed towards those governments and companies that continue to prioritize fossil fuels. And we know that the effects are going to be both in terms of the experience around pollution and the associated, uh, as I say, economic risks that this poses, but also to be able to look at how it is that the vast sums of funds that are going directly towards either subsidies or the lack of uh, pollutant payer costs mean that we're subsidizing a system that is causing both our ill health today in terms of the climate, uh, sorry, in terms of our, of our own exposure to pollutants, but also the long-term and current effects of climate change. In the next slide, we have another key message, which is looking at this moment in time. And we know that this is a decision-making period. We know that this is some of the most important uh, responses that global uh, leaders can bring towards us, but not only global leaders as is countries, but also those who speak for us, who provide you know, services, um, who are instrumental within our economy, that there is a time now to be prioritizing health as a part of our action towards climate change and to see the benefits and the co-benefits of these actions as we look across the commitments that are being made. So this health-centered response is a way to which we can better deserve a future that we're going to be capable of not only surviving here, but thriving. Um, so the next slides are going to go through a few of the indicators. So we have five working groups for those who might not be familiar with the last countdown. And we're looking at um, a set of uh, uh, indicators around climate change, mitigation, adaptation, and looking at the economic and political context. Um, so carrying on, <clears throat> um, we have the first indicator that I wanted to just highlight, and this is that we're seeing an increase in the exposure to vulnerability populations around heat waves. The reality is many countries around the world continue to age. We have increases in those temperature being experienced, and we see that this is going in the wrong direction around those who are being exposed older and very young. And this is associated with that increase in experienced temperatures and heat wave occurrences, which again, this past year has shown us um, just how terrible an effect uh, that can be. 
in the next slide, uh, we look at the um, exposure to um, heat. And this is again, looking at the mortality measurement of this and just showcasing the implications, the, the annual number of deaths, which you can see here, uh, rising to a scale of 100,000 in terms of countries being impacted. And so looking particularly in the US and India and China, that this high relationship as over time among the older population continuing to be exposed to high temperatures and the risks will continue to grow. In the next slide, uh, we have an indicator which is focused on wildfires. Again, uh, a, a present issue for, for Canadians, wildfires continue to increase in terms of their risk. And so this is the number of fire days, continued uh, fire days of risk, and this continues to grow as we go forward. And this is an interrelationship between not only forced uh, forced health and forest management, but also drought and the implications that has to populations who are living nearby uh, areas that are experiencing wildfires. So again, this is highlighting that the environmental changes occurring alongside where people are living. In the next uh, slide, we have another indicator which is looking at the suitability and increase in infectious disease. And the thing to highlight with this really is, although the infectious disease uh, continues to grow, it's among populations who have less experience than they used to, or who, this is a new population to be experiencing infectious disease that hadn't come into contact. And what does that mean for health professionals is needing to have detection attribution systems that are capable of being able to both be forward-looking and also treatment, uh, treatment based that are effective, knowing that we have new diseases coming into contact. So in the next slide, um, going to oh, uh, one more before adaptation, looking at the risks of undernutrition and food security. No, no, please, um, the, the slide you were just on. And so what we see here is again, the shortened crop and growing seasons means that the food insecurity risks are heightened. And this is a phenomenon that we're now especially seeing as trade and other security issues are, are causing challenges. So climate change exacerbates these risks for local populations and their ability to, to grow and provide food. Um, in the next uh, slide, this is looking again at an indicator around the preparedness, frontline workers, those in cities, those in, in, in health um, uh, healthcare settings, and the number of cities that are reporting that they have adaptation, which are uh, health and climate responsive. And so again, this is a growing number that are looking at ensuring that they're prepared, um, and that's incredibly important. In the next slide, we have an indicator that's looking at the information available for health service providers around climate and um, weather events. And so when being able to communicate to populations, do we have the necessary information? Are we capable of being able to provide that information? We see it's among those who are living in the very high HDI group countries. So basically the money and the funds have been spent to be able to uh, ensure that the health protection is among those whom continue to be best served and protected. And yet climate change is impacting everyone across the world. In the next slide, uh, and I apologize for going through this so quickly, but I wanna be able to give time um, for the speaking as well around uh, lethality of extreme weather events. This continues to grow. And so what this is a new indicator looking at how this accumulates and the lethality of events, although in the last several years, thankfully, is not increasing in terms of mortality, uh, but the activity of the occurrence continues to increase. And so this can, again, kind of loads the gun as it were um, to create a, a, a negative health outcome when the, the, the major events occur. Um, going forward to what is changing, um, what we see is that the energy system continues to, uh, for many high HD countries, start to tilt downwards. We're seeing emission strains, decarbonization is happening, but it's very slow. And the challenges that we look across the world is, are there going to be sufficient um, support for other countries? Um, Ian, maybe to skip forward to maybe the, the diet one, um, if it's possible, um, just to say air pollution continues to be a major cause of concern but around diets and, and co-benefits of actions. Some of the biggest impacts that we might see going forward is how we change our diet, um, not alone, and, and the contribution that has to emissions, uh, again, being a really important area for change. Um, and again, just because the time is, is very short, it's to go through to uh, the financial, uh, well, maybe just quickly here to say that the healthcare system continues to be a major contributor to emissions, as was mentioned before, but how it is that we're able to deliver uh, on our health commitments for SDGs at, this, at, at such a, a carbon intense system is going to be uh, you know, a need to complete change. So going forward as well around the uh, financial impacts, we track several indicators here, 
which are looking at the implications of uh, the costs of climate change, the divestment from fossil fuels, which continues to grow, looking again at the compatibility. If we were to, this basically the slide says, if the plans of the major fossil fuel companies were to come to fruition, we would be nowhere near a Paris Agreement and this has to change. And so then the last few slides are really talking about indicators that look at the media attention focused towards climate change and health. And this continues to grow. While that's a good news, it also implies that there's going to be a greater recognition that the health harms of climate change are occurring today. And then the last one, uh, an indicator that looks at the, the government debate um, in terms of high level conversations in UN General Assembly. So these intersecting of climate change continue to be a part of the argument. And on that note, Ian, thank you very much for the, um, the time. I just reiterate the three messages here and really looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you so much, Ian. Uh, that was an incredibly concise but uh, comprehensive overview of uh, another phenomenal report out of the Lancet Group. So uh, thank you for being with us today. And uh, so we're going to just keep going on right now. And uh, as as noted on this slide, the the this brief, the policy brief, came together uh, through a five month multi disciplinary collaborative effort of volunteers. So absolute, totally volunteers were involved with this. There are two lead authors with us, six co-authors, uh, and as previously mentioned, CPHA, the Canadian Medical Association, and the Canadian Nurses Association, using Lancet, data from the Lancet and, and with the, the goal of coming up with six key policy recommendations. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to one of the, the first lead uh, co-lead author, uh, Claudette Petra de Rosier, uh, and I'll turn it over to you, Claudette. Thanks, Ian. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be joining you today. I'm, I'm based in uh, Montreal. Um, I work as a family physician and I've been involved with the Lancet work for the last three to four years. And uh, it's always a great opportunity each year to sort of generate the discussion on, on climate change and health and where we're at and sort of provide uh, recommendation as to where, where wh what we can do better. Um, next slide, please. So um, this year brief is dedicated in three main parts and you'll have uh, one author presenting for each part today and I, I'm presenting the first part. Um, we focused a bit on the impacts of climate change on our health system per se and the, the role and responsibilities of the health system in, in responding to climate change. Um, and for us, it means that um, healthcare must lead by example um, by preventing pollution related diseases and deaths. Um, so we've looked at, you know, the responsibility of, of, of healthcare. We know that globally, um, healthcare, at least in Canada, is responsible for about 5% of GHG emissions, um, which is considerate. Um, the Lancet data shows that this year that our emissions are increasing if we, if we look by capita, and that is plus 1.3% from 2018 to, to 2019. Um, there's different initiatives going on in the pro in, across the country, and um, we're thankful for that because what we're realizing is that there's a lot of locally led initiative, uh, but there's a lack of currents um, between them just because there's no, currently there's nobody to, to, uh, to coordinate this or to attach a different initiatives. Um, things that you know, we, we are being inspired from and we believe that we should, um, we should highlight on a more regular basis are initiatives such as Choosing Wisely that are very well known within the medical community. Um, choosing Wisely inspire us to um, do only necessary testing for the, at the right timing for the right patients as to up to 30% of what we ask in medicine is deemed unnecessary and, and um, yeah, unnecessary. So we believe that if we apply choosing wisely principles to our work um, as clinician, there's a, there's a likelihood to reduce the, the, the carbon footprint, footprint of, um, of our healthcare system. Other work that is, um, that is quite interesting is the work done by Andrea McNeil in BC. Um, she's published recently on, on planetary healthcare uh, framework. Um, and we also know there's, uh, there's been other publication across the world, such as in Switzerland. Um, they've come up with a very brilliant report on how can we operate health system within planetary limits. 
Um, so the problem that we state and that we realize and that we've been we've been involved in ongoing discussion in the last couple of years are the, the fact that um, such local health system initiatives are quite inconsistent and they don't have the resources to do the work that they, they would like to do. Um, we believe that the model that the UK uh, through the, the NHS um, initiatives can 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 be of, of reference. Um, but we also know that Canada has already made has already made a commitment in 2021 during COP26, basically signing on on a WHO initiative on sustainable healthcare system. Um, but it's been a year, and we don't we, we haven't seen that coming into um, into action concretely. Next slide, please. Um, I just found it important that we we highlight some of the examples that we we are currently seeing across the the, the country. Uh, one of this is one of them is something close to where our work in uh, in Laval. So this is like um, north of Montreal. They, to our knowledge, um, well, they are one of the first um, healthcare sort of sub regional system to do a carbon footprint analysis. And if they're not based on the different scope that we often see when we do carbon footprint um, analysis, um, they've done, they, they've used it, they, they have used a methodology that was not been used before and that's quite revealing into where we could have a win-win um, action to decrease quickly carbon footprint. Um, and their next step is basically to address those. Um, so stay, I, I, I'm just sh sharing this to, to highlight the, the leadership that we're seeing emerging on the local level. This is one of them, but there's many more across the country, but we think it's important that those initiatives um, travel across the country so that we, we can learn from, uh, from each other. Next slide, please. Um, so the first recommendation goes into that direction. So we believe that it would be important to establish a national secretariat um, to ensure that liaison between provinces and territories um, and liaison with international initiatives such as the um, climate and health networks and resources that already exist. For instance, the WHO Alliance uh, for Transformative Action on Climate Change and Health, which is quite new, um, very interesting work going on there. So we believe we should, we should be liaising well with them. Um, and this will lead to a well-needed transformation of Canada health system um, into a system that would be operating within planetary limits. Next slide, please. The second scope of this section um, is on improving increasing resilience to climate related impacts. Um, we've used a definition from the WHO in terms of what's a climate resilience system. So I'm going to read that. It's worked from a couple of years ago, uh, but it's vocabulary, vocabulary, sorry, vocabulary that we haven't seen really um, incorporating uh, health ministries uh, sort of work. So a climate resilience system is a system that has the ability to anticipate, respond to, cope and recover from and adapt to climate related shock and stresses um, in order to bring sustained improvement in population health despite an unstable climate. Um, we believe that a climate resilience system uh, may help save lives, especially when facing increasingly more common climate extreme events. We've had example of that in couple of in the last couple of years. Um, we can think of the heat dome in Vancouver in 2021, um, the wildfires in the Territoires Nord, sorry, the Northwest Territories in 2014, um, and in Quebec a few years ago, we have we had massive floodings um, that um, has increased the pressure on um, psychological um, and communicative support with for, from our local health system. Um, in order to do that, we think it's important that um, those initiatives sort of are linked to what's already being done, um, such as the upcoming national adaptation strategy that is a work done by uh, the government of Canada. We are waiting for the strategy to be published in the next couple of weeks, but um, it's important that there's component of a climate resilient healthcare system within that. Next slide. So this is where we're coming out with our second recommendation. Um, to make sure that we know what the needs are, we need to conduct analysis across healthcare systems in the country, um, given the, the fact that healthcare system is often provincially and, and territory land, um, those type of analysis should be done on those, on those level. Um, and the findings from that can be used to improve our preparedness um, in order to reduce structural and social health inequities. Um, I will I will now lead the, give the floor to our to Courtney for our next uh, section. Hi there, thanks so much, Claudel. 
so I've been involved with this project since the beginning here in Canada. And so I'm going to take a second to just go through a couple of the recommendations for our previous reports. You know, why do we do this? What, what happens after we've done it? Next slide. So in 2018, after having passed a motion of the Canadian Medical Association General Council um, saying that the Canadian Medical Association supports carbon pricing, we put a recommendation for carbon pricing into the report and we co-wrote this with an economist and made the argument that as we phase out fossil fuels, air pollution decreases, that leads to less presentations to the emergency department for asthma, et cetera, saves healthcare costs, is better for health now and of course into the future. Um, as the economics uh, literature shows that uh, carbon pricing works compared to uh, counterfactual examples. Next slide. And as we know, uh, we did end up having a national price on carbon. So we met with ministers in both the uh, Ministry of Health and of the Environment, uh, supported them in their work, uh, were interveners. I think the CPHA also was um, in the various uh, court cases. And we're very happy when the Supreme Court upheld uh, the national price on carbon. Now, uh, in 2021, we pointed out that we're still subsidizing fossil fuels a tremendous amount. And Canada is one of the worst offenders on this uh, topic. Uh, and as Ian mentioned, this is central. We are using our public dollars to subsidize the pollution that is killing uh, children uh, with asthma. Um, all around the world, and also um, putting our health and health systems at risk. That makes no sense, especially uh, this year when the uh, companies are making such huge profits. So we would never do that with tobacco, um, and we need to stop doing it with fossil fuels. So our government, of course, has committed uh, to stopping uh, subsidies, but we, we remain a country that subsidizes fossil fuels uh, a great deal. Next slide. Our country. So where are we at? So this data is from 2019 from Life the Countdown. So in 2019, we collected $4.1 billion in carbon pricing revenues at the same time as Canada gave out, and this is only direct subsidies. So it doesn't count uh, indirect subsidies, tax breaks, et cetera. Uh, we gave out $2.3 billion in uh, real US dollars to the fossil fuel industry, which means that our net carbon revenue was 1.8 billion. So we're taking two steps forward, one step back, not going to get us to where we want to go. Next slide. So, you know, why are we in this position? Uh, we, we haven't had a really clear approach. And I have been really lucky over the last uh, year or so to serve in the Canadian Medical Association board with uh, Dr. Elika Lafontaine, who, of course, is the first Indigenous president of the Canadian Medical Association. And I think uh, all of us would say that having the Indigenous voice reminding us about the importance of health for the next seven generations. And this is something that certainly I have really found in my work. I've been living in the North for 11 years now, uh, serving a majority Indigenous population. And I've learned a lot from the land that I have learned as much about planetary health and caring for the land from the leaders in my community, from my neighbours, from voices like Dene Scholar, or Dr. Nicole Redvers, next slide, who was central to putting interconnection, to ensuring that interconnection within nature ended up as really the central tenet of the planetary health educational framework that was published in the Lancet several years ago. Next slide. So when we think, okay, so how can we stop having such a disconnected, discombobulated approach to fossil fuels? Right now, we talk about carbon pricing, we talk about targets for CO2. We know from the communications literature that that doesn't really resonate with people. We have experts in Canada, in the land we now call Canada, who have always based their community values around the well-being of the next seven generations. And we now have opportunities to thread some of that wisdom systematically through our laws. So one of our recommendations, and I wrote this section with uh, Dr. Deb McGregor, who's an Indigenous scholar, is to accelerate the incorporation of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples into Canadian law. This process is ongoing. We've historically been slow to do it. We can really put a push on and say, hey, we have voices in Canada who are experts on this. Let's listen to them and make sure it's threaded through our laws. Next slide. And as part of that, ensure that we're not, as we currently are, um, having a situation where racialized and Indigenous uh, people in Canada 
so frequently have their communities cited next to fossil fuel extraction projects. Uh, we don't do research on this. Uh, we have a situation where structural disadvantage means that it's more difficult uh, for those communities to achieve the power necessary to stop the uh, and also uh, to clean up projects once they've happened. And so we are suggesting as part of a planetary health oriented approach, as part of an approach that moves us away from fossil fuels to a more uh, holistic approach that we as a health community very much support the implementation of Bill C-226, an act respecting the development of a national strategy to assess, prevent and address environmental racism and to advance environmental justice. Next slide. So I will now introduce one of our wonderful, uh, diligent co-authors, uh, lead author, uh, Finola Hackett. Hi, uh, thanks, Courtney. Um, so I am a rural family physician. I work in Southern Alberta, as well as the Yukon. Uh, I'm uh, sitting today uh, coming to you from Lethbridge, which is in Treaty 7 territory, the traditional unceded territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Um, I'll touch on a couple points before moving into section three here. There was a question in the chat around, oh, and this is my third year as a co-lead author, which has been a great experience. There was a question around indicator selection, which Ian Hamilton answered in terms of how the global team selects their 43 indicators, which do, as he mentioned, evolve each year, depending on the importance and available data. So how do we select which ones are highlighted in the Canadian brief? We basically look at these 43 indicators. Now, not every single one always has national level, national level data for Canada. So we work with the global team to figure out which ones are available. And then based on that and the ones that we are, our author team as a, as a group decides, we think are topics that we um, want to highlight or policies areas that might be important we kind of correlate that with the available data and that's kind of how we, how we select them it also changes year to year so some topics we might not cover this year because we highlighted them in last year's or the year before's policy brief so that's kind of a quick breakdown of how we do that um, and my section is focused on uh, communication so i'm very excited because we really wanted to talk about how we can speak better about climate change and health, which is an area we haven't really had a policy recommendation on before. So next slide. So um, first, in terms of governments, and this is governments of all levels, both federal and local, we are seeing increased engagement in climate change and health, and there's a lot of initiatives out there. On the national level, earlier this year, there was a Health Canada assessment that came out on climate change and health for Canada. So if you didn't know about that, I encourage you to take a look. And there also was a report just just last week, just when we released the policy brief, Dr. Teresa's Tam's, Teresa Tam's office came out with a report on climate change in Canada. So we are seeing those connections being made and also more locally. So there's various, um, and this is just a couple examples, but there are several across the provinces and territories of governments that have looked at um, health systems resilience to climate change, climate change and health as an issue for their governments. But we did note that these efforts are siloed and we don't have a health in all sectors approach. And so that's where we came up with our recommendation for this year. Next slide. And so um, one thing that can really help to focus climate change policies and communications is focusing on health co-benefits. And so this means not just health sector policies or health system policies and not just saying here's climate change and health here, we're gonna put it in a box, we're gonna put it on this policy box shelf, but actually taking it and integrating it into transport policies on a municipal level, energy policies on a provincial and a federal level, and all these other sectors, food policy. I mean, look at the cost of food. We need to talk about food and agriculture and climate as well as um, nutrition and those impacts on health. So we need to look at when we take action that um, addresses climate change and all these other policy sectors at different levels of government, can we also account for health benefits? Because if we account for years of life and disability and disease that are prevented by having, say, a um, rational, healthy nutrition policy that also improves food security or um, public transport and other policies, then we can actually show that these policies will be um, cost efficient in the short term and the long term by preventing those health outcomes. So that's something that hasn't quite been integrated yet, but it's, some, it's a next step that needs to be taken. Next slide. 
So um, in the second subsection, we talk more about uh, communications and media and other mediums. So this is Lancet data from 2007 to last year. And we see that the number, it got cut off a little bit, but that's the number of uh, media articles per year. Uh, as a note, this was just from three major English language outlets um, in Canada. So it did not include French language publications and it did not include every um, media outlet in Canada, but just three selected ones that the Lancet was able to track. And you can see that the absolute number of articles where climate change and health are covered has been increasing and nearly tripled over the last uh, 15 years or so. So that's, that's a positive indicator. Next slide. So we are seeing more recognition of climate change's impacts on health. Um, and we see that also an increase in proportion of all articles in climate change mentioned in health. So um, of all climate change related articles, about 20% or so, about one fifth mention health now, which is actually quite an increase from about 13% or closer to 10% in the past. Still 80%-ish climate change related articles don't mention health, but we have seen an improvement. And we also did our own literature review as well as taking um, some of the Lancet data on academic publications. And we see that those are also increasing in terms of scholarly research on climate change and health. However, both in terms of academia and in the media, and you know, our team has seen this when we, when we analyzed and looked at it, but also those of you attending might have noticed this, noticed this an anecdotally. When you hear about climate change and health, it's often you know, air pollution is, is killing, heat waves are taking lives, causing morbidity. And our group and our um, advocacy um, colleagues focus on this, obviously to get the attention that climate change is impacting health, but something that we need to also focus on, especially now, is positive messaging focusing on sharing stories of successful local adaptation, whether that's done by your local municipal government or a local First Nation that is doing really good work for um, a sustainable future. And we need to share those stories so that we can learn from each other across Canada and spur positive action. Because we see in behavioral change literature that people are more inclined to take action when they're feeling hopeful and positive rather than the doom and gloom messaging. So we need to make sure that those voices also get amplified. Next slide. And so that's kind of our recommendation here is where nonprofits, media academics, and you know, even just, you know, I'll put it out to everyone intending today in your day-to-day -day life and when you have these conversations, think about what kind of mitigation adaptation strategies need to be promoted because we know that it's a problem and that's a health issue and how can we um, I'll take action to address it. So that's, I'll leave you with that to be a bit hopeful and positive. That is great. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm going to stop sharing so we can actually see each other. And if all of our panelists want to turn your cameras back on, uh, we have some great questions from the audience already. Um, and I'll put the first one actually to you, Fanola, because it was just asked about your presentation. Uh, it's like, which uh, newspapers did you use for your media coverage analysis? You're on mute. Sorry, I just want to pull that up, but I believe it was the um, Globe and Mail, the National Observer and the Toronto Star. Let me just double check that. Um, CBC was not included. That, so I can double check that, but I believe that was it. That certainly would have skewed the data because CBC is one of the uh, probably do more in this area than most others. Uh, Claudel, uh, there's three questions in the Q&A module in en français. If you want to uh, handle those, that would be very helpful. Oui, je vais je vais répondre aux questions en français. Si jamais on a d'autres dans l'auditoire qui veulent qui veulent poser des questions en français, il y a pas de problème là. Vous voyez, je suis je suis, je suis québécoise de, donc le français est ma langue maternelle. Euh, la première question, en fait, les, les questions se, se tiennent là concernant le rôle et la responsabilité du réseau de la santé. Euh, choosing wisely, en fait, commence à avoir une réflexion sur le, le caractère environnemental. Là, on a eu une, une rencontre pas plus tard que la semaine dernière qui rassemblait le différent euh, différents groupes qui étaient intéressés par cette question-là, dont l'Association médicale canadienne l'Association canadienne des médecins pour l'environnement, euh, mais ça commence à faire partie des réflexions. Choosing wisely au centre de ses préoccupations, le choisir avec soin, c'est beaucoup le, le, le soin aux patients en, 
tant que tel, le, 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 la volonté de, de ne pas nuire et d'offrir ce qui est adapté en temps opportun, euh, mais ça commence à s'intégrer aux, aux réflexions. Euh, donc oui, certainement, il devrait avoir un peu plus de recherche là, sur le cycle de vie. Ce qui limite beaucoup, entre autres, c'est qu'il manque énormément de données là, sur l'empreinte environnementale de certains médicaments. C'est très difficile à tracer. Les compagnies pharmaceutiques, ce n'est pas nécessairement des données qu'ils qu qu partagent là, facilement. Donc, il y a quelque chose à faire. On a certains, certaines données, entre autres, là, par exemple, sur, sur les inhalateurs, mais ça reste des catégories de médicaments là, assez spécifiques qui ont déjà été identifiées comme étant plus polluants que les autres. Euh, et, et sur les autres efforts qui peuvent va être fait là, mais en fait, c'est intéressant parce que oui, éventuellement, il faudrait, faudrait augmenter en fait tout ce qui est fait en prévention, promotion de la santé avant même que les gens développent des maladies ou du moins pour atténuer l'ampleur de certains types de, de, de maladies chroniques. Là, on sait ce qui prend beaucoup d'espace, surtout en Amérique du Nord, c'est tout ce qui est maladies chroniques non transmissibles. C'est intégré dans les réflexions. Là, donc, si on va voir un peu ce qui est fait sur le, le travail, entre autres, de Andrea McNeil avec les, euh, le cadre de santé planétaire, ce qui est mis de l'avant, c'est une augmentation en fait des efforts en amont avant même qu'on arrive au système de la santé. Euh, puis je, je, je cite un peu euh, Andrea McNeil, qui, qui est chirurgienne de formation, elle dit « c'est très rare que vous allez entendre dire ça de la part des chirurgiens », mais elle dit « moi, mon seul plus fort, <rire> un de mes souhaits les plus importants, c'est d'opérer juste quand on a vraiment besoin puis de limiter les opérations non essentielles euh, ou non, euh, non nécessaires. » Puis euh, je pense que c'est un peu dans cette lignée-là qu'on qu doit aller, euh, mais je pense que ça découle un peu de normes culturelles qui, qui nous dépasse où on a beaucoup misé sur le curatif et c'est d'ailleurs ce qui est souvent mis de l'avant dans les, dans les politiques de santé des différents gouvernements. Donc, euh, ça, 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 ça ramène à un rôle renforcé pour la santé publique et les, la première ligne qui sont souvent, euh, en fait, du moins au Québec en ce moment, là, on parle énormément d'accessibilité à la première ligne, euh, mais une réflexion, je pense, beaucoup plus large là, pour sortir un petit peu la santé des soins tertiaires, des soins quaternaires ou des hôpitaux qui ont énormément d'argent puis qui laissent une première ligne et, et même l'avant-première ligne là, un, peu, euh, un peu au dépourvu. J'espère que ça, ça offre des éléments de réflexion pour la question qui était complexe. Excellent. Uh, so, we have another question from Yvonne Tourville. Uh, thinking of the book Capital and Ideology and in connection with these climate crises, what about a major reform date that aimed at taxing much, much, much more uh, high incomes, high assets, inheritances in order to finance both new technologies, but also health services and education systems? Would anyone like to tackle that one? Well, maybe I'll just quickly um, add, when we look at uh, regulations and particularly the uh, subsidies, as was mentioned within the indicator that we're looking at specifically around fossil fuel industry, the realities are that governments have a variety of means to be able to uh, put at their disposal and incentivize, whether that be their own organizations or public and private sector organizations to invest in decarbonization on one hand, but also ensuring, yes, you know, health resilient health health systems are available. Um, taxes are going to be one of the ways to do that, certainly, as are going to be setting targets and setting requirements around services. So just to briefly reflect on what Claudia was saying about the, um, the health services, uh, we helped in the National Health Service for England and their carbon footprint. And again, it has to do with, yes, a major component of it being supplies and, and uh, um, elements being used within the healthcare system that come through the logistics and supply chain. They can set targets and they start to demand those changes. So I think that, yes, we're going to see a lot more in innovations around how governments, but also organizations choose to regulate them, um, themselves and those whom are responsible for them. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ian. Anyone else want to add on to that one? I, I would just say that there was an initiative for World Health Day that I believe the Canadian Public Health Association um, joined us on uh, Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, I think Canadian Medical Association also signed on calling for a wholesale transition to a well-being oriented economy. Um, we're quite lucky actually, the Department of Finance has put forward, they did a whole bunch of work over the pandemic very quietly and had apparently 10 people working on a new series of financial indicators that would allow us to keep track of well-being um, in addition to GDP. But right now they're publishing them in an appendix to the budget instead of foregrounding them. So our ask on World Health Day was to say, hey, please publish these right beside GDP figures so that we can start to reorient the entire objective of our 
national project around well-being. And I think once we do that, we'll start to see some of these taxes align with where we've now explicitly said that we're going together. Thanks, Courtney. Uh, so we have a question from Aaron. What role can health technology assessment play in helping Canada's health systems make climate informed decisions? Uh, very good question. I, I'm, I must say I'm not the most familiar, familiar with what the, the health technology assessment can actually mean, but I think the more information and data we have, the better decision we can make and one of the things that is currently lacking and the reason that I, I quoted the the example from Cis Laval is that by having analysis that informs us of where our gaps are and what we can do better um, this can help drive um, evidence-based solutions I'm not sure if other panelists wants to ask to that but um, that would be my my, my first uh, remarks yeah, and I, I'm also not an expert, and you know, Aaron would love to hear more about health technology assessment, just because I know don't know a lot about that, but I would agree um, what would be great if we can use technology to, to furnish this would be uh, better information sharing across jurisdictions so we can coordinate the climate uh, adaptation response. So the uh, example that Claudel gave from Laval was really interesting to me, and I was like, hmm, I'm in Alberta. Do we have anything like this done on our emissions? So I went and looked it up. Um, this was earlier this year, and I emailed it to Claudel, and I said, hey, we do have this report that I sort of dug up through the AHS Office of Sustainability, but they actually use somewhat different methodologies in how they estimated their scope one, two, three emissions. And so, I mean, it was interesting, but I feel that if those folks had talked to the Laval folks, they might have learned something about, okay, are we accurate? Are we actually estimating our emissions properly? And that's just one, you know, quick example. So there are these initiatives being done that are very much siloed. So if health technology can find a way to improve information to, um, sharing and de-silo some of these efforts, um, share um, those sorts of efforts to estimate emissions and reductions in that, that would be great. I'll right. just jump in and say that uh, Dr. Andrea McNeil, who was one of our authors, I think last year is actually leading a Lancet commission um, whose explicit purpose is to standardize some of this measurement, which will get us one step farther to being able to spread and share best practices. Excellent. Thank you, everyone, for your answers. Uh, now, Michelle uh, wrote in French, uh, and I'm doing a loose translation, how can we include traditional medicines in the healthcare system? And I would imagine we could have an entire one hour tele uh, webinar just on that topic. But does anyone, um, I know Deborah McGregor, uh, who was the legal indigenous legal scholar who was part of writing, wasn't available to join us for today's session. But uh, is anyone feel comfortable? Uh, taking that question? Well, I'll just say what we're doing in the North. So Dr. Nicole Redvers uh, is a extremely well-known um, Dene scholar, history of uh, training in naturopathy. She's now doing her PhD in sustainable healthcare education with an Indigenous lens at Oxford. And she helped to start the Arctic Indigenous Wellness Foundation. They got an Arctic Inspiration Prize and started it up and what happens now so it's a land-based uh wellness structure small community where people can go um sort of self-refer and it's really based around community and living on the land and nature and the hospital where I work in the Northwest Territories, about twice a week, um, patients from the psychiatric ward have the opportunity to go there and spend time on the land if that's something they want to do. So I think, you know, the more we learn about uh, the health benefits of nature, um, Dr. Melissa Lem, who's uh, the president-elect of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, has really been spreading a lot of nature prescription programs around Canada, when you think about it, that's what Indigenous uh, wisdom has told us all along. So I think from an evidence-based standpoint, every single small uh, element of Indigenous um, uh, recommendations would need to be evaluated for a potential benefit, for potential harms, but we have some places we can start right now. And I think a lot of that is around interconnection with nature and incorporating that into our uh, conventional medical systems. Thank you so much, Courtney. Uh, so a question, it's from Princia, who is putting it 
directly to the to the authors of the policy brief, but I think maybe Ian Hamilton, you might want to chime in as well. Um, have you seen any changes uh, from last year's recommendations? Any of the recommendations that have been made? Um, or and she said, or is this kind of is this uh, a, a, a repeat to to initiate action from, the, from government? Um, is are there any particular indicators that we've seen changes on? Well, just to briefly, yes. I mean, what we do continue to see is that things like NDCs, for example, this is something that this year we wanted to really highlight was that in those policy commitments that governments are taking in addressing climate change, the presence of the health concern, the health risks that need to be able to adapt to protect for that basis are now being included as part of the argumentation. So that that's certainly a sign of, of awareness um, where we see the kind of the change making occur um, decarbonization through the energy system, you know, it is taking place. Um, many countries still have a long way to go, but that's that, uh, you know, clean energy access and, and uh, reducing of, you know, reliance on coal and other dirtier fossil fuels as part of the generation process are improving air quality and local air quality. And you see that in cities particularly, whom, for example, have, uh, you know, no longer got the smog or ozone challenges because of, say, nearby coal fire power stations. So those things are not being tracked necessarily at the national and international level, but we are seeing the benefits that are being associated with those. So, you know, those are good signs, but we've got so many other indicators that are flashing red warnings to us that we just have to continue to press that attention. Absolutely. So I'll go to next question uh, from Helen Doyle. Are you aware to what extent the healthcare sector has been engaged in the climate change and health vulnerability and adaptation assessments that local public health agencies are conducting in Canada? Um, I, I, I can I can take your first uh, first part of the answer. Um, it's a, it's a difficult question, as we know. It's 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 hard to report to it what everything that has been going on, um, as there's a lack of where the information is shared um, and known. Um, so in some places, we we believe and we know that there's been engagement of healthcare professionals in those type of assessment, but at in other places. Not so sure. So I definitely there's a there's a need to do better and to better share the information. Um, there's plenty of example. I, I I know pretty much was I mean, I have a good understanding of what's going on in Quebec uh, province, but less in other parts of, of the country. So uh, some colleagues of mine may may want to help. We've worked with um, on this part of the brief with Chris Buse who. Uh, Jan from CPHA knows well, and he, he conducted an analysis of the BC healthcare system resilience to climate change impacts. I believe their report will be out soon, if, and they've worked with, with local healthcare professionals. Um, so some of the work is already has started, but not to the extent that we we believe it, 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 it it's needed um, with the, the, the threats, uh, the, the amplifying threats of climate change. Thank you, Claude Adel. Uh, so I think we have time for one last question uh, from Eric Young. Should all major industrial and infrastructure projects not only be required to have environmental assessments and economic assessments, but also required to, health, to have health impact assessments? Would someone like to take that one? Oh, I can just mention, oh, Courtney, uh, yeah. Oh. Go ahead. I'll just say uh, Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment and Canadian Public Health Association, we were all extremely active in advocating for that. And uh, the government has introduced a, a new um, Health Impact Assessment Act that includes enhanced health and environmental um, components. Uh, and really, it's, it's up to us to continue to really push, but the framework is there. And part of it is not just having a health impact assessment, but what the scope of that is. So for example, you could have one where you might look at the direct pollution impacts of a tailings pond from a, an extraction project, but you might not incorporate the 10, 20, 30 year impacts of the significant emissions or land impacts of that project as a whole. So we need to no look not only at these very discrete short-term impacts, but have assessments that include the broader health impacts. And so it's also a little bit of that that we're trying to encourage um, in these assessments, I would say. 
Thanks, Fanola. And Fiona Hanley has reminded us that also the Canadian Association of Nurses for the Environment uh, has been very active in this file and has been part of effort, advocacy efforts on that uh, topic as well. So thanks for, for that reminder, Fiona. Um, so uh, Zishan uh, asked, during the last de decade, data indicates that rural and Indigenous communities are at most risk for climate change from BC to Nunavut. Is there any community-led initiative in process to combat, combat this risk for our Indigenous communities? There are multiple different initiatives. Um, there is an initiative in the Arctic that in fact, um, I think it's called the Northern Guardians Program. I might have that word slightly wrong, but it actually has um, equipped uh, indigenous uh, people in the North with G the ability to log what they're seeing from a GPS perspective. Uh, on the land to enhance current traditional knowledge related land use safety. And so that's that's what I know is happening um, where I live. There's certainly many other initiatives uh, across Canada. Are we, are we where we need to be? No. Absolutely. Well, we are at the top of the hour. So uh, unfortunately, we have to uh, call an end to our proceedings today. I want to thank uh, Ian Hamilton uh, for being part of this uh, today's session uh, coming to us from uh, the Lancet Global team uh, all the way in the UK. Uh, Courtney is over in the UK too as well. So you're uh, both crossing the pond uh, virtually, which is a good thing these days. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Jeff, for being with us and representing the Canadian Medical Association. I want to note that Sylvain Brosso, uh, Brosso, sorry, had to leave early. So, but uh, his uh, thoughts were with us as we continue the webinar. And a huge thanks to our two co-lead authors, Claudel and Finola, for another phenomenal uh, policy brief for Canada. And uh, really appreciate all of the effort that you put into this work year after year. Thank you all for joining us. Today's webinar was uh, recorded and will be made available on CPAG's YouTube channel. Everyone who registered will be will receive a notification when that uh, recording is available. Have a great day. Goodbye.